Can I now welcome Daphne uh, to uh, talk to us about um, another, uh, no doubt, emotive topic, sexual violence in conflict-affected and post-conflict context. Daphne comes from the Brussels office of MSF, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, thank you as well for the opportunity to talk here again on, on this topic. Provision of care for survivors of sexual violence, standardized or context specific. Let me start with giving you a very brief snapshot on the background. For many years now, sexual violence has been widespread in the DRC, giving it the country the name of being the rape capital of the world. And particularly in the Eastern DRC, being a zone of active conflict, rape is used as a weapon of war. At the same time, in other regions of the country, with, labelled as being post-conflict, still high rates of sexual violence have been reported. And this is equally so for Liberia, where during 14 years of active conflict, unprecedented high levels of sexual violence have been reported. And despite the war ending, still there are high reports of sexual violence. So in response to this, MSF wanted to implement different programs to take care of survivors of sexual violence. One was a vertical program in Liberia supporting three sexual violence clinics. Then in two projects in DRC, the same package of care was offered or was integrated at hospital level and decentralized at different health center levels. So with this offer of the same package of care, we questioned ourselves, is this adapted to these different contextual settings? So for this, we wanted to describe and to document on the characteristics of sexual violence survivors, the patterns of sexual violence, and what are the medical consequences and its clinical management. So this study is a retrospective analysis of, standardized, uh, of standardly collected data. In Liberia, data was collected over a period of two years, including 1,500 individuals. In DRC, data was collected over a period of one year, including 671 individuals. Ethics approval was obtained. For all survivors coming to the clinics, that standard package of care was offered by specifically trained staff to provide sexual violence care. And this package includes psychological support, medical history taking and examination, wound care, post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV when a survivor was presenting within the time frame of 72 hours, STI prophylaxis or treatment, emergency contraceptives, termination of pregnancy, hepatitis B and tetanus vaccination, and there was a provision of a medical legal certificate. Next to this, MSF invested this as well in extensive awareness and health promotion activities. The main message being, if you have been raped, come for treatment as soon as possible. It is free of charge. So these awareness activities could take on many different forms, from leaflets or billboards, talks and community meetings. And here I want to highlight a different strategy which was implemented in DRC in the Massissi program. The maman conseillère or the mother counselors. These are women living in the community and they were charged with the task to deliver messages on what is sexual violence and the importance of going and look for care and treatment. There were trusted persons within the community, so they could on taking a role of counseling the women of also taking care within the good time. The limitation of this strategy is the number of people it can reach. So looking into some of the results, we can see that over the three programs, the majority of survivors seeking care were female. Only one in 2% were male survivors. When looking into the distribution of age, I'd like to highlight here in red bars in the Massisi program, the conflict setting, that most seen 
most of them who were seen were adult women. While looking into Monrovia and Iangara, the blue and green bars, we see that the majority were children and adolescents. The type of sexual violence which was most reported was rape. In Masisi here, the bar in the middle, and the, I want to highlight the green and red part, is that the number of aggressors was higher in that context. And this was also associated of having more brutal forms of, of assault in Masisi. There was more association with use of weapons and other associated violence. What we know on the side of the perpetrators is that the most common perpetrator in the post-conflict zones were known civilians, while in the conflict zone of Masisi, the military was the most important aggressor. We also know that amongst children up to 12 years, 17% of them reported that the aggressor was a minor. The blue, bar, the blue part in the bars at the left graph show here the proportion of survivors presenting within that critical time frame of 72 hours when prophylactic treatment can still be initiated or is most effective. We see that in Masisi, 60% of survivors came to our service within that time frame. For both Monrovia and Niangara, this was lower. In relation to referral source, I want to highlight here that the community talks in Masisi, including the system of the Maman Conseillère, managed to link 20% of survivors to into care. The drama, the other approach that was used in Niangara, helped to link 17% of victims into care. Although the package of care was the same, the uptake was sometimes different. So this graph represents the initiation of treat the coverage of the initiation of treatments. The blue and red bar here shows the initiation of PEP and the STI prophylaxis, which had a good coverage with even close to 100% in both DRC programs. At the same time, we see that the uptake or the provision of emergency contraceptives in Monrovia, the green bar at the left, was very low. Not half of the patients being eligible didn't re receive the, the emergency contraceptives. From the survivors who reported of becoming pregnant as a result of the rape, more than half of them requested a termination of their pregnancy. In three out of four of these requests, the abortion was performed. However, in Masisi, we see a very different trend, where there is a much lower request for the termination of the pregnancy, and no abortions were performed in the study period. This is surely a problem within the RC, because there all, involuntary, all voluntary abortions are criminalized by law also on the grounds of rape. So returning to the initial question, we could see that there were some important differences in patient characteristics and in patterns of violence. This makes that we need to be able to adapt our services to what we, what we can expect. So should awareness activities be tailored to reach those we expect to see, but also to those that we don't see yet in our programs. We need to focus more on collaboration with partners to refer to, for instance, in post-conflict settings where we can expect more child survivors, we need to be able to refer them to child protection services. Also training of staff can include modules to focus more on the victims we see. For instance, counselling of children or examination of children is very different from adults. Then adaptation of the package of care needs to be tailored as well to adolescents' needs. As we learned here from the experience in Monrovia, an important an proportion of adolescents reported that they had consensual sex with someone of their own age the package of care and the counselling they need is different. At the same time, we, see, we saw some similarities between the different settings. So there was a low proportion of survivors presenting within the 72 hours. 
We saw only very few male victims, although we know that there are more, and there's a low number of follow-up visits in general. Limitations of the study is that we don't have specific data on the perpetrator's age, and we do not know why some of the survivors did not receive the treatment they were eligible for, such as the emergency contraceptives in Monrovia. And then there was the component of the psychological support, but the database was different, and we were not able to cross-link this data. This is a facility-based study, and from an operational perspective, we can say that both studies in Morovia and Niangara were rather done late. They were done towards the end of the program. So in conclusion, we can say that this kind of analysis can contribute to that we, that we can see that standardized provision of care, that it will leave gaps. But at the same time, it also contributes to identify where are the areas that we need to reinforce or that we need to tailor our services differently. From there, we also would like to recommend that an early and thorough analysis of program data should be done quite early on. After six, nine months, or perhaps one year of program, it's good to go into depth analysis so that it can be tailored according to the context. I'd like to thank, first of all, all the patients, the ministries of health involved, the whole team of investigators of the different studies, and for you, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is time for a few questions before we start the panel. There's a gentleman with a blue top in the middle here, and someone at the very back will be next. Thanks. Please remember to say where you're from and your name, please. Florian, um, working for MSF in Brussels. Um, did you look at whether or not the perpetrator was a stranger or known to the victim before the incident, or coming from, this, from the family even, and was it different between the sites? Thanks. OK. There are more breakdowns. I couldn't present the whole ad, all of the results we have. But for the different settings, we know if they were known, if there were civilians, and then if there were known civilians or unknown civilians. Um, and so this we know for the, for the places that mostly in the, in the post-conflict settings, that a lot of them were civilians, but also an important part were known civilians um, to, the, to the victim. Um, which was different from, from Assisi um, in the conflict setting. The gentleman at the back, please. Yeah, hi, uh, Petrian from MSF Sweden. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that the MSF provides a legal uh, medical certificate. Mm -hmm. is, the, uh, is some form of legal assistance also included in the package of care? As for example, in Kibera, where MSF actively assists the, the survivors of, of rape for uh, pressing charge and Okay, thank you for that question, um, because it's one questioned a lot, like should we even provide the certificates because what is done further? Um, it depends a bit on the setting where we are. If, uh, if we can give more uh, support for, for pressing charges or legal or the legal support, um, what we found out as well is that it's important to link up with, with services who can do that, as we are quite limited in MSF. However, it depends on, on where we are. And for instance, from here, we learned that in the newest setting we have now in Zimbabwe, in the clinic there in, in Harare, that we put more efforts as well to, to support uh, victims who want to press charge, that, um, that they have the support they need also at that legal site. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tuan, a volunteer with MSFOCG and the International Office. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, what are your thoughts regarding strategies to really get the treatment, the life-saving treatment, uh, emergency contraception, perhaps, in time for the uh, uh, survivors. Um, our community-based approach, such as getting a package of drugs in the uh, community, maybe with the maman conseillère, so that uh, uh, survivors could access them before they could be linked to our services. Uh, would that be considered? And then. Um, what are your thoughts about targeting also perpetrators in terms of treatment from a public health point of view? 
Um, so the, if, if you go into the papers, there, there's some more results that we have there. And for instance, what we did in Masisi was mapping uh, from where were the decentralized health centers and then to see from where did the, the survivors come from. And then we saw that it was very important to have the decentralized approach as well, where at least the minimum package, which is like the PEP initiation and emergency contraceptives can be given, and perhaps for psychological support, there can still be a referral at hospital level that this contributes uh, to having a better rate of uh, having this, this treatments provided within the 72 hours. Um, I don't think that we went as far as discussing on the maman conseillère if they could, for instance, initiate these kind. But definitely, um, decentralization has shown that it works, that it really increases that. Um, what we know as well from Assisi is that still um, the reason why uh, survivors came late is that they didn't know about the availability of treatment or the existence of the different treatments. And from Nyangara, we know that the, uh, one of the main reasons was given that uh, fear, fear and stigma and fear for stigmatization as well to come to the services. So uh, we, we know really some points to, to work on further what we can do, and a lot is to make it uh, to make our services known and accessible and acceptable for the survivors. It's a, it's definitely a working point. It's as important uh, as being able to provide the medical treatment, but to, to make it accessible. Okay, Daphne, and would you care to answer the second yeah. more controversial and difficult question, I think, whether you feel that uh, there should be a service for the people who caused the rape or the violence, other types of violence, um, uh, from the point of view as a public health measure? Um, I'm not a, I don't think I, I can really mm. give something into that, but perhaps it could be an interesting one for later on okay. in the panel discussion. I would be very interested to have more of an idea of what the audience would yeah. think of that. And to be honest, I, I'm not very sure if I can give a reasonable answer to that one. That's probably a good point on which to thank you again for your presentation <laughs> and invite the panel to come. Uh,